You know, there are those gut check moments in life when a person faces adversity or despair. It's at that moment you have to make a decision to, to fight through the pain, to get to a better place, or just to give up and fall into the abyss forever. This episode is about one of those critical life-changing events. With one foot in the grave, this artist actually used a flop house to be a sanitarium to get rid of a, a lethal drug addiction and to turn his life around. He wrote a poem about this watershed period of his life and he shaped it into a classic rock masterpiece. The story of this down now beat poet who became the muse for rock's first power trio. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you know every member of the classic bands for every iteration of that band, or you want to know, this is going to be your channel. We interview the great artists of the rock era. You never know what's in store from day to day, so make sure that you subscribe below so you don't miss out. Click the bell so you're first in line to know when these come out. And don't forget to check out our exclusive content on Patreon. The link for that is below. So today's song really needs no introduction. You hear it, you know it, you love it. It's a classic rock colossus. And it's the perfect song to introduce our newest show that I'm going to call Jukebox Poetry. The greatest lyrics in the rock canon. White Room by Cream. Uh, there's a lot of history and character behind this haunting avant-garde rock classic. Uh, the music was conceived during a purifying bicycle journey across France by Cream lead singer and bassist the great Jack Bruce. The song's lyrics came from a different kind of detoxification, lifted out of the depths of hopelessness from an eight-page narrative written by 60s beat poet Peter Brown. Before teaming up on the making of White Room, uh, Brown collaborated with Cream's super trio of Jack Bruce, Eric Clapton, and Ginger Baker on three of their most celebrated tracks, I Feel Love, Sunshine of Your Love, and S-W-L-A-B-R, which of course stands for She Walks Like a Bearded Rainbow. Brown's collaboration with Cream saved his floundering career and likely saved his life. In the early to mid 60s, Peter Brown was meandering about, trying to be part of uh, Europe's bohemian scenery. He was nothing more than what he called a barman, taking whatever gig that he could get for little or, or no money. He often got on stage for free drinks, actually. Brown was essentially homeless, with virtually no stability. After he was expelled from school, Peter hitchhiked his way across Scotland. He slept in hostels and even abandoned ammo yards from World War II. You can believe that. His relationship with his then-girlfriend, that was also going nowhere. It was a destructive romance that had both lovers emotionally exhausted. Brown was the victim of the self-inflicted doomed artist syndrome brought on by the heavy use of heroin. Of course, one of the most addicting and dangerous narcotics out there. Many musicians romanticized the effects of heroin during the 50s and 60s, including Peter Brown. Uh, with his relationship crumbling, really his career in the toilet, and his very existence hanging in the balance, Brown stumbled into a flat near a passenger station for London's underground mass transit system known as the Tube. It was in that flat, with nothing more than a, a rickety bed and a scuffed up chair inside, that Brown made a cold turkey stand to get rid of the heroin and to turn his life around. Before he met the same fate as his hero, Charlie Parker, who was only 34 when he died from myriad health issues exacerbated by massive drug use. So while undergoing the anguish of several withdrawals, Brown wrote about his desolate sanctuary with no window dressing, describing really exactly where he was, in the white room with black curtains near the station. With black curtains near the station. Brown's poem went on about, you know, air pollution in the area that he lived, which he called Black Roof Country. Black Roof Country. And a 
a reference to poverty-stricken surroundings that he coined No Gold Pavements. Great lyrics here. No gold pavements, tired starlings. Throughout the White Room poem, uh, Brown exercised his demons, first his addiction to heroin, I'll wait in this place where the sun never shines. Wait in this place where the shadows run from themselves. <laughs> Amazing. From and then Brown faced the other demonic force that was destroying him, his doomed relationship with someone that despite all the turmoil, he still loved. You said no strings could secure you at the station. You said no strings could secure you. Platform ticket, restless diesels, Goodbye windows. Diesels, goodbye windows. I walked into such a sad time at the station. As I walked out, felt my own need just beginning. Wow, just mesmerizing lyrics to, to paint this picture. Felt my own need just beginning. Jack Bruce began arranging the music for White Room in his head while cycling across France, like I said. When he returned from his trip, he set out to create a song, one that reflected the feeling that he had during the project. And actually, the arrangement was inspired by the music of one Jimi Hendrix. Uh, Bruce explained that Hendrix had a unique way of using chord changes to modernize traditional ideas. <laughs> Hendrix returned the admiration of his esteemed peers. He was a big fan of their music as well. Cream had even more luster than the independent genius of Eric Clapton, Jack Bruce, and Ginger Baker. There was also the magical synthesis between Jack Bruce and Peter Brown. It was actually Ginger Baker who approached Brown about writing lyrics for Cream. Uh, Baker was intrigued by Brown's uh, unique prose. He had a truly beautiful way of, of combining uh, striking realism, illustrating a wide range of imagery. Freshly cleansed from his drug addiction, Brown was rejuvenated with the idea of writing for the trio in hopes that he would finally be able to establish himself as a songwriter. Although Brown and Baker got along, it was clear from the outset that Brown's artistic chemistry was gonna be with Jack Bruce. As with the earlier Cream song collabs, uh, Bruce asked Brown to write lyrics for one of Jack Bruce's musical compositions. Bruce's arrangement already had a distinct narrative structure for Brown to instinctively build around. Brown's initial stab at the lyrics for the yet untitled track was centered around a, a doomed hippie girl as the subject. He called his first attempt Cinderella's Last Good Night, which met a tepid reaction from Jack Bruce. So Brown turned to that eight-page poem that he wrote when he was detoxing from heroin. After all, that poem was perhaps his most personal uh, and most moving piece maybe that he'd ever written. The eight-page poem needed to be streamlined, of course, so Bruce and Brown made a pre-computer age cut and paste <laughs> and revamped the poem, uh, condensing it down to an emotionally charged song simply titled White Room. In, the white room. In addition to the kindred rapport of uh, Bruce and Brown, White Room is recognized for its unorthodox 5-4 time signature in an awe-inspiring intro and of course repeated in a momentous bridge. As we further break down this song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. You know, it's simple. If you need a new pair of glasses, you just go to zenny.com. You design your own pair or several pairs for less than the price of concert tickets or a concert ticket. Hundreds of pairs start at only $6.95. You won't believe the quality. Check it out today at zenny.com. So Ginger Baker trusts the song's uh, verses together by playing triplets on toms and unleashing uh, thunderclaps on his bass drum. White Room really exhibits Eric Clapton's gifted use of Vox Clyde McCoy picture wah, an apparatus that mutes the treble and bass when the effects pedal is pressed, uh, commonly referred to as the wah-wah pedal. It really adds another element to the song's uh, already incredible theatrics. Clapton's wah-wah pedal delivery sounds like a snapback response, taunting Jack Bruce's lead vocal with a, a sneer of sinister delight. At the party, she was 
most kindness. In the 60s, Hendrix was the supreme studio innovator. But, you know, Clapton was right up there with some exhilarating sonic heights. Now, for the song's grand finale, though, Clapton opens up his strap, warping up and down and side to side to serve up a, an epic acid trip solo that ranks as one of the psychedelic era's best of all time. The offbeat time signature and the suspended inverted chords that gave White Room its distinctive originality it was too unconventional for the golden ears of the executives at Cream's record label, of course. The executives actually told Jack Bruce the song would not connect with a mass audience. Uh, label executives were, of course, wrong. White Room was Cream's second highest climber on the Billboard Hot 100, peaking at number six, just one position lower than Sunshine of Your Love that went to number five. It was a number two hit in several countries, there in Canada and the Netherlands, and it shot all the way to number one in Australia. Many still find it surprising that Cream developed a much bigger following in the United States than they did in the band's British home country. In the UK, Sunshine of Your Love was a, a mid-charter at number 25, and White Room stalled at number 28. Just head scratcher. Unbeknownst to the general public, though, by the time Cream released White Room as the lead single representing the studio half of the Double Wheels of Fire album, Bruce, Baker, and Clapton had already decided to break up the band. Shortly after White Room was dropped as a single, the band announced that an upcoming 15-city run would be their farewell tour. Bruce and Baker could no longer tolerate the, their constant battle of egos and you know, personality clashes with Clapton caught in the middle between the two musical titans. The discord between Bruce and Baker, that started well before Cream was even formed. It began when the two were part of Graham Bond's project called the Graham Bond Organization, featuring a lauded body of work in a seminal record titled The Sound of 65. There, Jack Bruce played bass and provided vocals and a harmonica on The Sound of 65 with uh, Ginger Baker, of course, on drums. Actually, The Sound of 65 was suggested by Melody Maker magazine as being uh, perhaps the greatest album of the 60s. Definitely one of the most exciting and influential of its time. It garnered high praise from luminaries like Steve Winwood, John Lord, and Bill Buford. Yeah. So the London recording session for White Room with Jack Bruce conducting and Felix Popolardi producing were fraught with tension between Bruce and Ginger Baker. Tension that was pretty much constant throughout the short history of Cream. Clapton recalled how their contempt for one another manifested itself on their very first talk through rehearsal. This was at Ginger's residence in a suburb of Northwest London before their official announcement to form a trio, even before they formed the band. Jack and Ginger got into a heated argument right off the bat after Ginger learned that Jack had leaked their plans to form a group in a press interview earlier. It was the first of countless fights between Baker and Bruce, often escalated to fisticuffs, actually. Although they were only a unit for three years, Cream was one of the most important and influential bands of the entire rock era, no doubt about it. Cream created some of the greatest rock fusion ever recorded. And they're a rock's first power trio, you know, paving the way for a new era of heavy rock and blues bands such as Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath that blended complex melodic structure with the uh, esoteric messages delivered with the sonic thunder of rock and roll. And they were so far ahead of their time. I mean, their sound was easily 10 years into the future and challenged the up and coming artists of the 70s to, to vibrate a little bit higher. For Peter Brown, Cream was a savior. His work with the band was a watershed period for the vagabond artist. After the breakup of Cream and Brown's reputation as a lyricist firmly established, friends actually convinced him to form his own band. It was Pete Brown and his Battered Ornaments. Cool name. Even though it was technically his group, with his name at the forefront, Brown has the dubious distinction of being fired by his own band. Pete Brown and his battered ornaments were the opening act for the Rolling Stones playing in front of an estimated 300,000 fans at London's Hyde Park with Brown performing lead vocals. 
Uh, Brown's bandmates were so disgusted with his singing performance that they actually staged a mutiny and sacked him just after he left the stage. Imagine that. I'm gonna show you, baby, just what my politics are. Later, Brown formed uh, Pete Brown and Pinlock Toe, working with keyboardist uh, Phil Ryan and the aforementioned Graham Bond, who truly had a, a cult following among his peers. And in segments, really, of the British press that often regarded Bond as the father of the English rhythm and blues outbreak of the 60s. Oh, yeah. Bond, too, had his bouts with drugs and with mental illness. He was prone to manic episodes and periods of severe depression. Following the breakup of the Graham Bond organization, Bond actually moved to America. He recorded a couple of inconsequential albums and performed session work for artists like Dr. John and Harvey Mandel. In May of 1974, Bond actually committed suicide by throwing himself in front of a Piccadilly line train at Finsbury Park Station in London. He was only 36 years old. Jack Bruce passed away in 2014, and Ginger Baker did in 2019. And of course, Eric Clapton became a superstar guitarist, vocalist, and lyricist. He's now the surviving member of that brilliant trinity. Pete Brown continued to collaborate with Bruce on and off after the dissolution of Cream, but their later work never came close to reaching the level of what they had achieved with Cream. Actually, Pete is still writing and occasionally performs the songs he wrote for Cream in front of a live audience. White Room, with its haunting storytelling, its beautiful jukebox poetry, and riveting artistry by three of music's most revered musicians, continues to intrigue new generations of fans and, of course, pop culture. 2000, Apple computers placed White Room in their major TV advertising campaign during the launch of the groundbreaking White IMAX. White Room was also used for a scene in the 2019 movie, The Joker, where the title character is sitting in the back of a police car. Uh, the Joker has that menacing smile on his face as he observes and admires the destruction he has caused to the fictitious city of Gotham. It's just a perfect cinematic moment with the song. As for covers of the song, some of the more notable ones include uh, versions by Waylon Jennings, there was Ace Freely, Pat Travers, Deep Purple, and Sheryl Crow. In the white room with black curtains. You know, I remember when my dad would listen to Cream against all of the other just tremendous, amazing artists that he loved from the, the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. I would just marvel at Cream and how they could bring that much power and sound from just three people. For years, I actually assumed they were a 70s band. Well, my dad told me that he bought his first Cream album in like 1967. I was pretty floored. I thought maybe 73 or 74. I didn't realize they were before Zeppelin and Sabbath. Like I said, they were so far ahead of their time. They created really the blueprint of a lot of hard rock and metal that would follow. But it was thinking man's rock. And no other song proves that as well, lyrically, as White Room. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Cream. Do you think they set the blueprint for all that? What are your thoughts on this trio of Clapton, Bruce, and Baker? What are your memories of this band, the song, and your thoughts on the, the incredible poetic lyrics? If you like our videos, we do invite you to subscribe below to be a part of our community, rock history every day, stories from the legends, and make sure to check us out on Patreon as well. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.